Living Waters presents On the Box. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another edition of On the Box. It is Monday, May 9th, 2011, which marks our last full day in Israel. Mark, have you ever been to Israel prior to our trip? I have one time, and let me tell you, it's been said that uh, two weeks in Israel is equivalent to an entire year of Bible college. Really? And that's what it did to me. It opened up scripture. I was able to picture everywhere where Jesus walked, and uh, it just made scripture come alive, and I think that's what it's going to do for the rest of the team. So leading up to our, your second trip, for some of us our first trip, what were you hoping would happen your second time around in Israel? Um, you know, m much of the same. You know, we, we need to be reminded of uh, not just our first love, but be reminded that the very feet of the disciples that walked through those city streets are no longer there. So the eyes of God are no longer on those people. Hmm. They're on us. Okay. They're on the yeah. church, you know. So that's what I wanted to do. Once again, I'm reminded, you know, that uh, God's eyes are on me, and there's going to come a time very soon when God's eyes aren't going to be on me because I'm going to die and they're going to be on somebody else. So I want my life to count. So in Israel, stamp eternity on my eyelids. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> all right. Uh, today's giveaway, uh, as we're doing all week while we're in Israel, is two packs of the Celebrity Million Dollar Bill track. Uh, if you'd like to win that, just email us at onthebox at livingwaters.com. Onthebox at livingwaters.com, full name, full address, and your zip code, please. Uh, since this is a pre-recorded program, we won't be announcing uh, the winners today. But uh, if you won those tracks, we will be uh, emailing you to let you know. Also, visit our blog whenever you can at onthebox.us, onthebox.us. All right, we've got a lot we want to do today. Uh, one of the topics we want to talk about today is biblical repentance. Now, why, why do we use the word biblical prior to repentance? Well, there are several different definitions uh, regarding repentance. And uh, Mark, being our dean, dean of the School of Biblical Evangelism, right. and, and uh, probably one of the smartest guys I know, can you tell us the difference between an unbiblical form of repentance and biblical well i think if, well if you're going to bring the bible into it which i'm glad you I did i think we should you know yes. we can look at the example of uh, judas being one that uh though it's found in the bible it's not necessarily biblical because after he found out that what he did was wrong and he knew all along what he did was wrong right uh he went and he hung himself well there's a worldly sorrow yeah. that isn't necessarily biblical repentance that's going to lead to death and you can always distinguish between biblical repentance, true repentance, and worldly sorrow because one's always going to lead you to life and the other's going to lead you to death. You know, uh, I think the world likes to uh, describe uh, repentance uh, along the lines of, hey, you got caught. What do you have to say? Right. And usually the confession comes out after they were caught. Okay, I was caught in this act. I shouldn't have done this. But then they begin to, uh, you know, swim backwards and try to get out of it and go try to, I guess, maybe give an excuse why they did what they did and try to uh, uh, downgrade uh, their crime. Biblical repentance is always, you don't even have to get caught. This is what I did. I was wrong, and now I'm willing to even confess this to somebody, you know, before I'm even found out. Yeah. You know, so you turn from your sin, repentance, you turn from your sin, and you turn towards God. There's biblical repentance. You're not just turning from, but now you're turning to. And when you're turning to God specifically, you're going to find yourself in the hands of a faithful creator who's there to receive you. You know, Jesus said in Luke 13, unless you repent, you're going to perish. Luke 13, verse 3. And then two verses later, he repeats himself. And right. he says, unless you repent, you're going to perish. So whatever it means, and we just defined it, turning from and turning to, you better do it. Yeah. Because if you don't do it, you're going to perish. So what about the argument that uh, repentance is really nothing more than the changing of, of one's mind? I hear that argument quite a bit. Well, by and large, at face value, there's nothing wrong with that. Because we do change our mind. Absolutely. But you change your mind, but now what's happening? Because if your mind is changed, but then you continue in the act, you know, it's been said repentance is sorry enough to stop. But you can't stop because we love our sin. We love our iniquity. We drink it like water. So I do change my mind that it's wrong, but now I'm changing it to whatever God now has for me. What does he have for me? So I am going to change my mind, and I'm going to call on others who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And I'm going to say, hey, gird, uh, gird up alongside me. Help me. And uh, there, that's, 
the missing step. Yeah, so change your mind, but now turn towards God. What does God have to say? Uh, here, here's an example. I was out on the street, and I was sharing with a guy, and I said, hey, um, where do you go to church? Because he claimed to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, funny thing you say that, because when I woke up this morning with my girlfriend, I said, hey, we need to read the Bible more. We need to uh, go back to church. And I said, wait a minute, you're sleeping with your girlfriend. And he said, yeah, absolutely. I go, let me ask you a question. When you became a Christian, did you repent? And he said, absolutely. I said, well, what did you repent of? And he left out fornication. Hmm. And I go, well, it seems to me that you forget 1 Corinthians, where it says that no fornicator will inherit the kingdom of God. And he said, well, are you saying I can lose my salvation? And I said, I'm not saying I can lose my salvation, but are you sure you have your salvation? Yeah. You know, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. And I, and I left him really with that. You know, that no fornicator is going to inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't look like you've repented. You need to repent. Amen. Now, there are those out there who would argue that to call someone to repentance uh, is to call them to do a work. It, it becomes a work righteousness formula for salvation. What do you say to that? Yeah, well, he, remember John, John the Baptist, when uh, the Pharisees entered onto the scene. And he looks over at them and he says, You brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath which is to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. So in other words, he's saying, as uh, James went on to say, mm -hmm. you claimed to have believed, to have faith. You claim to have repented. Well, where's your fruit? Fruit is a natural byproduct. So I'm not going to, if you look into my life, uh, serve God to gain his acceptance. I am accepted, therefore I serve God. Repentance is a natural overflow of a heart of an individual who glimpses upon the cross of what God has done inside their life. It's not a work. It's, it's, it's a work. I agree that repentance is a work that is originated in heaven. Right. That God does that inside of me. He, he compels me to repent. His, loveness, his loving kindness compels me to turn towards him. You know, so yeah, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. And if you want to throw repentance in there, then there's a misunderstanding of what repentance is. You know, repentance is preached all throughout the Gospels. So I command people to repent. I don't invite them, but I command them to repent because they have to repent. Unless they repent, they're going to perish. And all along, they're going to realize that it's God enabling them to repent all along. And we see an example of that in the Sermon on the Mount. Yep, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. In Matthew uh, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, we're commanded there uh, in an imperative uh, to enter through the narrow gate. I like the way John MacArthur uh, words it. He says, Nowadays inside churches, we see an invitation for people to come forward. Nowhere do you see Jesus inviting people to come forward to repent of their sins. It's commanded. You are commanded by Almighty God to enter through the narrow gate. And if you don't, you're in disobedience and you are therefore sinning. So we don't invite people to respond to the message. We command people to respond to the message. Mm. And if they don't respond, they're in gross error. They're sinning. Against, uh, against a holy God. All Absolutely. Right. Chad, any thoughts on, on the subject? Uh, yeah, the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And when you take into consideration repentance, faith and repentance are inseparable. We've okay. covered this on episodes in the past, and uh, I have an article on the blog about the inseparability of faith and repentance. Uh, whenever you believe, uh, the same sort of belief that uh, John uh, has a hope for his readers uh, to believe, uh, based off of his gospel, uh, he wrote those things that they would believe. It's a sort of a loaded term that implies repentance. They're not two separate things, as Mark said in Ephesians 2, 8, uh, 9, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. And part of that through faith, faith is not works, and uh, a correct faith in God implies repentance. Uh, they could be thought of as uh, two separate sides of the same coin. So whenever you believe, it implies repentance. I kind of like what Mark said. I don't know if I have it exactly the same, but I've heard it this way before. Uh, whenever you uh, come over here, it implies leaving over there. So there's you know, two things in one action. Uh, so whenever you believe in God, it naturally is. It's a change of mind, but it's not just a mere intellectual change of mind. Like, oh, I think about this differently now. But it's a change of mind that uh, totally takes over uh, everything about you. So. All right. Now, before uh, we went on air today, you were started to share with me a, a story that uh, yeah, you know, I, kind of illustrates this. I, I recently was on a, uh, uh, on a plane ride, and I was sitting on the aisle seat coming back from a speaking engagement, and there was a gentleman sitting in the middle seat, and he was on his way back from the Olympics. He won a gold medal in uh, wrestling. 
and he was all by himself, and there was a guy by the window, and not, the three of us didn't know each other. We were traveling separately. And the guy in the middle, when he found out that I was a Christian, he said that he was a homosexual. He was on his way back to uh, San Francisco where he lived. And I leaned into him when he said he was a homosexual to let him know, hey, I'm, I'm okay. I'm not scared by you. I'm not a homophobic, you know. But the guy by the window leaned away from him. So, okay, so... Let me stop you for a second. Why do you think he, did he just volunteer that yeah, information? Yeah, it was a little shock, you know. Was I, it to try to keep distance between you? You or? know, I, I don't know necessarily. Uh, I, I think that um, he was trying to catch me off guard. I think he didn't want to engage into the conversation at that point. But when he, when he told me that he was homosexual and he just got that gold medal in wrestling, I said, you got a gold medal in the Olympics just now. Can I see it? And I put my hand on his shoulder and I, and I was reaching out to him. Mm -hmm. letting him know, hey, I'm, I'm okay. You know, I'm not scared by you. I think a lot of uh, homosexuals think that we're afraid of them or we look down on them or we degrade them. And it, it, it's not the case with uh, authentic Christianity. Right. So he pulls out his gold medal. I looked at it. I put it on. I wish I had a camera, you know, <laughs> take a picture of it. And I never brought up homosexuality in the midst of our conversation. So the whole plane ride, I'm now engaged in this conversation with this guy who won a very cool medal, you know, representing now, our country. How often do you get to meet someone who's actually done that? Yeah, right, absolutely. And as big as you are into sports, that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I never brought up homosexuality, and I went through the Ten Commandments, and I never, like I said, brought up homosexuality. And at the end of our conversation, he said, well, what about my lifestyle? And all I said was, well, it seems to me you know what you need to do. And that's why he asked the question. Yeah. The con his conscience was already at work, or it otherwise was. he wouldn't have even asked the question. Absolutely. And, and his response was, you're right. You're right. You know, so I, I don't, I, you know, I need to look up to see who's won the gold medals, you know, in, in, in wrestling to see if I can get in contact with the guy yeah. to see what happened. But uh, I think he, at that point he was ready to repent you know, of his sin. And I didn't drive home homosexuality. I went through... His, yeah, his conscience said, was already at work on it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Chad, you had something? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good idea whenever you're talking with somebody that uh, sort of uh, gives this information that I'm a homosexual. Sometimes you could sense that this is sort of their... Uh, their baby, their hill that they want to fight on, and they, they get a, an emotional block uh, if you harp on it. So like Mark did, it's a really good idea just to uh, point out other sins so that they could think a little bit more clearly about it. Otherwise, they, you can just imagine. Imagine something that you're very protective, very emotional about uh, maybe a, a family member or, or something of that sort. And if some, somebody starts harping on, you know, uh, what, what that family member of yours, you know, constantly does wrong at work, you, eventually you're going to get this emotional just, ah, just block. So it's a good idea to just go through some of the other personal sins that they have in their life. And uh, like Mark pointed out, you know, at the end of the conversation, they're going to know what to do. It's all about, you know, uh, what's God's will for us? What's he want for us? And, you know, he doesn't want that. Amen. All right. All right. Let's uh, go to some questions out of Facebook. We've uh, gotten several lately. Uh, first one's from Zach. He asks, how should you approach a brother who has shown a lot of pride while out doing evangelism, i.e. not allowing anyone to correct or give advice after an open air. How can you lovingly approach, lovingly approach your brother in Christ? Now, Mark, you've led evangelism teams for many years. Ever run into this? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think more as of late than in the past. Really? Yeah, I think. Any that idea why that might be? Yeah, you know, I think it is. I think that the internet has bred individuality. That we hide behind a computer screen, and we don't put faces to what we come across. So we get okay. all of our understanding and knowledge, you know, from pa other people's pastors and there's no accountability. So we, we act as an island, you know, Proverbs 18, it says that a fool does not seek counsel. So I would say if you're going to approach an individual like that, you would want to uh, uh, just pull out scripture, you know, in a real loving way. In fact, Proverbs 18, it says a, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. You know, I tend to stay away from people that are like that, and I want to be around people that are sponges. Because I want to be a sponge. I want be people to be able to speak into my life, no matter what. And I, I thank God that I have somebody in my life that can come up to me and just say, Mark, man, what do you got going on? What, what yeah. was that? What are you doing? Yeah. You know, and, and we need that. We, we can't mature from that place where we no longer have the ability to speak into our lives. So if you have someone like that 
on your team per se, or it's someone out you're going out with regular to do evangelism, and they just uh, they just refuse to be teachable in one area or another. Uh, at what point do you say, hey, you probably shouldn't uh, be coming out with us for a while until you come to grips with this? Yeah. He, uh, well, I know if I, if I lead the team, you know, I, I also lead a team. I, as you know, I lead a team with uh, Easy. Right. Every Friday night we, we have a group of uh, people. And I would say, hey, go seek Easy's counsel as well. There's wisdom in the multitude of counselors and see if he sees what I see. You know, so... I think it's a good idea when you have the ability to lead with another individual, go ahead and do that and go up to other, go up to people and say, see if he sees what I see, you know, and if you have the ability to do that, do that. If not, say, all I'm asking is you to pray about it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Chad, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I believe it's a second Timothy three sixteen that all scripture is uh, God breathed. It's inspired and it's profitable for a whole lot of things for uh, doctrine, correction, uh, reproof. So go with them uh, with the word of God open and uh, you do it in love and I think that everything will turn out uh, all right as long as they're willing to receive it. If they want to be uh, an island to, them, un- to themselves, a uh, lawn to themselves and just uh, reject what you have to say, so be it. But uh, the proverb says in twenty-seven seventeen, as iron sharpens iron, so shall one man sharpen another. And whether it be an issue of uh, pride or uh, just maybe they need to be corrected on a few things. I have been that person that needed to be uh, corrected early on. When I was a, a new believer, I started open air preaching uh, pretty early on. And I was just off a little bit on my Christianese. I, I wasn't totally up on the lingo. I used words like, uh, you know, accept instead of receive. And, uh, you know, just this is a cautious reminder to you folks out there. Whenever you hear somebody like, oh, share the gospel with me. Give me the three minutes to live. If they say something like, well, you know, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I think sometimes there's a tendency for us, because we're so up on it, yeah. uh, to jump on that person and go, Jesus doesn't need our acceptance. Well, you know, the person probably didn't intend it that way. So uh, give them an opportunity just to pause for a moment. Now, when you say accept Jesus Christ, do you mean this in the sense like Jesus Christ needs our acceptance? Or do you mean it like uh, you receive Jesus Christ? And I've never actually met anybody that uh, has thought that, you know, that Jesus Christ like needs to, needs our acceptance yet. So it'd be nice to kind of fix that up with people, uh, correct them on that. Because I really appreciate that somebody took the time with me to say, hey, uh, you know, using a word like accept, we don't see that in scripture. Uh, What we do see is is receive. And I changed my way uh, after learning that. Or I used uh, terms like separation from hell. I wasn't up on it, or I'm, I'm sorry, separation from God instead right. of hell. Hey, what we see in scriptures, we don't see it so much as separation, but we see them uh, with no qualms uh, mentioning hell. Jesus used hell. Okay, so I, I start using it from that point on. So, you know, that's kind of uh, how good things can go, you know, if the person's ready and, and willing to listen and, and willing to be taught. But if they're hard headed, they're hard headed, what can you really do about that other than, you know, gently confront them, pray for them? And uh, it's going to be on a case by case basis, uh, right. deciding you know when you're going to go separate ways or tell them you know don't be a part of our, our, our group anymore. Yeah, and you know what? This I think this question is uh, another another good reason why it's so important for those who are out doing evangelism to to be under the authority of the local church. Uh, you know whether you're serving as the evangelist in the church or whether you're a Christian fulfilling the Great Commission like every other Christian is supposed to. You, you need to be under the authority of pastors and elders who yeah. have the wisdom and, and who are praying for the body and who are your teachers uh, so that they can come alongside you and help you mature in your faith. It's when people go out there to be an island under themselves, like you said, when so often they get into trouble. And you know we, we can name a number of open-air preachers who maybe when we first came in contact with them, first met them, first went out on the streets with them, they were really solid biblically. Right. Yeah. And then over years, over you know, a, a year's time or whatever, uh, they start to slip in their theology you know, to the point where now they're out there preaching heresy. And, and when you, oftentimes when you ask people like that, you know, where do you go to church? No answer. Yeah, because they don't. They either dodge it all together or, you know, they just come out and say, no, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm leading a home Bible study now. And, and, well, who's overseeing you? Well, nobody. Right. And then their home Bible study is all about evangelism. And there's no doctrine and deep theology uh, being poured into them. And there's no accountability. And there's no shepherd inside their life being able to help them. Uh, do normal things, raise their family, you know, how do I work properly at work, you know, right. how do I apply the scriptures, and 
So it, it and is they a tend shame. to surround Absolutely. themselves with people who believe the same rhetoric yep. that yep. they do. So, Tony, you're actually yeah. going to be writing a book about this, I think, in in the future. Oh, I don't right. know, maybe someday. Yeah. Well, it's out there. You did the uh, the interview with. Uh, Lane Chaplin? Right? Yeah, I, I'm kind of on the hook now. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope to someday. I, I think it's real important that we have a biblical understanding of the relationship between those who do evangelism and the local church. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're seeing more uh, people going out and becoming nomads, becoming islands unto themselves, calling their evangelism team their church. Yeah. You know, and everything revolves only around evangelism right. and, you know, everything that you said. So. Yep. All right, the next one's from Craig D. I give his uh, last initial because we have a couple Craigs. Uh, how do you respond to biblical men of God who are preaching biblically, however, don't think that we should be out on the streets, but should be developing relationships, sharing the true gospel, and discipling those who ha that have accepted, i.e. not witnessing to strangers? I'm confident the ones I'm referring to are true believers. I know them, and I've you know, seen their hearts for a long time. So they don't, so he feels that we shouldn't be... No, he, Craig feels that we should be out there, right, but, but the, the, pastor, leader, the, the leader. pastors, the leaders over him are saying, no, you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, you shouldn't be out there proclaiming the gospel on the streets, talking to strangers. It should be all within the context of, well, friendship evangelism, I guess. Right, so the woman at the well was, was off. Jesus had an off day, I guess. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because he, did he know the woman at the well? You know, uh, or Philip getting caught up and he talked to the Ethiopian eunuch. Right. You know, he didn't know him, you know, didn't know him from Adam. Yeah. Uh, and, and every time Paul went into a new city, he started at the synagogue to, right. to try to reach the Jews. And then he went to the Gentiles in that city. And many of these places were new places for Paul. He didn't you know, start by developing right. relationships in the synagogue. He wouldn't proclaim the truth and got arrested. Yeah, I, 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 yeah I'd simply say, what, what is your biblical precedence yeah. for, for what you say? You know, and, and throw the ball back in their court and be very open and gentle. Because sure. you know, we were all in that place. Yes. You know, oh, together. yeah. I know I was. So, yeah. We'd have to go back to our, once again, our, our biblical example is Jesus, you know, and we can look through the book of Acts for the early church to see what they did, yeah. you know, and I would dare to say, maybe not in all cases, but in, in most, that when they say, hey, you shouldn't be out there doing that, it's because there's a conviction in their own life and they're not even doing the friendship evangelism right. aspect of it and sharing with people that they know. Because yeah. the hardest people to witness to are people that you know very intimately yes. and you never get that far. Yeah, yeah, very, very true. Uh, uh, Chad, what do you think? Yeah, Ray's actually written a book that uh, in large deals with this. It's uh, God has a wonderful plan for your life. We bring this out uh, whenever we do open air preaching. And a lot of times we come across Christians that, you know, are questioning the way that we're doing things. They've never seen this before. So you be patient with them. You show them. And on the cover, it actually so shows uh, Stephen, the, the titles, God has a wonderful plan for your life, with these men, stones, you know, getting ready to stone Stephen. And uh, I typically, when I hand the book off to somebody, I, uh, I point at the picture and I go, you know who that is? And remind them that this is Stephen in the New Testament. Now, what do you think he was saying that got these people so upset? You know, wh what kind of time do you think he took with these people? You know, uh, um, try not to be too sarcastic, but, you know, are these people he was trying to make friends with? Or was he just, were these people that he was uh, concerned about? He, wanted, he shared the gospel with them and the gospel message uh, by nature is offensive. You don't got to make it offensive. It is by nature offensive. It's, Jesus said that I didn't come to bring peace on earth, but a sword, because that's what the gospel does. It's a, it's a dividing uh, line. Um, Mark chapter 10 is a, a chapter that I refer to quite often with other believers. It's a great opportunity to show them how Jesus used the law big time. Uh, you have an example of a, a rich young ruler coming, running after Jesus, showing uh, what seems to be real humility. I mean, could you imagine, I asked him, could you imagine somebody in the middle of this open air that we did earlier running up to us and asking Ray or I, you know, I, I see what you guys are doing. You guys just let me know what do I need to do to inherit eternal life. I think we'd be pretty tempted to be like, wow, this guy, uh, he's being convicted. Let's just share the good news with him. But what Jesus did with this rich young ruler is he says, you know the commandments, and he takes him through some of them. You know, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not bear false witness, do not steal. Rich young ruler says, all these things I've kept since my youth. Jesus, it tells his motive, looking at the man, loved him, and then it seems like he brings down a hammer, but he does this out of love. He says, this I have against you. Go your way. Sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come take up your cross and follow after me. 
And the man was sad at this word, and he went away sorrowfully. So the law revealed, and we wouldn't have known this unless Jesus took him through the law. The law revealed that he was a transgressor of the first and greatest commandment. He loved his possessions uh, more than he loved God. So it, we see it in Scripture. It's all over Scripture. So open up a Bible in love. Just show these folks. And uh, give them a, a copy of God has a wonderful plan, wonderful plan for your life. Yeah. Something else on that one, Mark? No. Oh, Okay. Uh, next one is from uh, Craig B. Why not limit our evangelistic encounters with unbelievers to just witnessing and giving our testimony, then inviting them to church on Sunday to hear the law and the gospel preached by or an ordained minister of the word in the context of a worship service? I, I read this several, several times to make sure I was reading it correctly. Um, Look, if you're witnessing without the gospel, you're not witnessing. Yeah, right. If you're giving a testimony without the law and the gospel, you need to check to see if your testimony is even, uh, even valid. And the idea of inviting them to church with the hope that on that Sunday the gospel is going to be preached by you know from any pulpit in the United States on any given Sunday. Yeah. You know, what do you think? Yeah, you know, when, when I got saved, um, I started to attend uh, the church of the evangelist who preach the message. Okay. And I was wanting more after a while because every message that he taught was on evangelism. But I realized I wasn't growing. I was just drinking milk, you know, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And I realized what I was really hungering for was doctrine. Tell me about Jesus Christ. And, and I was hungering for the things of the word. So when you have an evangelist who is a preacher on Sunday mornings as well, the, the main shepherd, and all he's teaching is evangelism, you're going to have unhealthy sheep. Yeah. So therefore, I think that the Sunday morning service is to equip the body, not just in evangelism, but in all areas, every facet Amen. of the life. Yeah. Teach the word, you know, expositionally, you know, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, teach that word. So if that word is not being taught, you're not going to have healthy sheep the way you need to have the healthy sheep. Right. So uh, you may not get that on the Sunday morning. I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that. As long as you're teaching through the word, sure. you're okay. So you go and share the gospel with those people who need to hear. Then bring them back and allow them to get healthy once they get saved. Amen. All right, and with that, we are out of time. We want to thank you for joining us for today's edition of On the Box. We will see you uh, tomorrow morning, Tuesday at 11.30 a.m. Pacific time right here on this channel. And until then, be encouraged, strengthened, and unafraid. Proclaim the gospel. You're full of it! Living Waters presents On the Box.